first started getting into racing, I was probably 13 years old. And uh, some guys in Watts Flats had uh, put a car together. That's when Skyline was going. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jamestown Speedway opened up again for a year or something like that. Well, they had a, like a 46 Ford sedan and everything. And well, that was a late model back then. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, there had, I think, four guys. Red McNett was one of the partners. Bud, Bud Yeager was and Carl Hellpenny. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who the other one was, but uh, it was kind of a real odd deal because Hell, I knew as much about mechanics at 13 than any of them did, and I used to work on the cars all the time. And then there was a guy up in the flats called Bunk Ecker. I was, I was his crew man too. But this is how I got started in racing was with all these guys. And, and sort of hanging around was it Rollable Speedway, right? Well, it's well started out at Skyline. Oh, Skyline, okay. Yeah, and, uh, and then they opened Rollable up. And then I, you know, hung around with them guys. And then I go up there and and just hang around. And I knew the McNets and everything. They'd let me in because I'd help them on the track. And, right. And uh, I'd go around. Uh, well, I was 15 years old. I got my parents to sign for me if I could race. So I couldn't afford to have a car myself. So I tried to bum rides from other guys. Okay. So you were actually out on the track racing. Oh, well. When I was 15, that's when I started, and I raced one race. Did you? And that's, I, I asked a guy if I could run his car in a heat race. Nice, nice old guy. And uh, sure, take it out. So that's how I got my start in it. In fact, when I first started, I, you know, I wasn't that good at all because I didn't have the finances or anything, you know, and right. just a poor kid. And, but I was interested. Really, when I got started, it was rollerball. Right. I mean, that was that was the same year I had my leg crushed when the water tank fell on me and stuff. Right. So after I finished high school and stuff, I put another car together and had run up there a few races and and then uh, well, I I think it was about sixty. Is when I met Ronnie. That's when he started. He started at Rollerball, and uh, they kind of, him and Frank Roman kind of took a liking to me, so, and Ronnie was, well, he's six months younger than I was, but he was a kid too, you know, yeah. so, we uh, we got involved, and then a little farther down the way, they started helping me out with giving me tips and everything, that's what, and Ronnie always says, that, he said, I just done that to keep you from zigzagging all over and wrecking me <laughs> but, uh, but we uh that was really the start of it and, and then the first the first few years i just raced off and on you know whenever i had money enough to get to the racetrack or with a putting a car together or something and and then we bounced around a little bit and and like I say, we raced at uh, Coon Road, and then there was a track up in Erie, it was Cool Road, and well, plus Rollerball, and then over to Arkwright, there was a track I run over there a couple of times, and but that's <clears throat> really how I got started, and that was back in the jalopy days. Well, what was your car number? <laughs> My first number when I started out was seven eighths because I was, uh, uh, I liked Dean Layfield, and he was 9 16 and, mm -hmm. and I just kind of liked the number 7 8 and so I took that, and then I found out they didn't, they didn't want any more fractions at the racetrack, so I What went. was it about Dean Layfield that drew your attention to him? He was a super guy, and uh, he was a winner, you know, he knew how to win races and stuff, and I just, Really liked the guy. In fact, he raced the car that I, I worked on with Hellpenny and McNett and all them guys. Mm -hmm. He raced that one time. 
his car wrecked or something. So they were always just take the car out and try to get somebody to race it for them. And, uh, they really never had a driver in it. And, I mean, they had uh, Dean Layfield drove it once and Art Anderson drove it. And, uh, that's pretty much how that went. The time I raced out there, I was involved with Blinky and, and there was a guy that had the, a gas station down there we all hang it, hung at that was uh, Bernie Jury. Mm -hmm. I owned it and, and uh, we raced out to, I don't know whether it was at Roller Bowl or, or Westfield at, or Coon Road that he wrecked his, his race car. So he says, and that was like a 48 Ford, and at the time, I think that's what I had was a 48 Ford Coupe. And, and he says, and he was from Julian, Pennsylvania originally. Mm. And he says, I got a car down, down in Julian. He says, I'll run down and pick that up. Well, it ended up being a 37 Ford Coupe. And he brought that back up. His grandfather gave it to him when he was a kid. And been in the barn, and the thing was just cherry. <laughs> And we just couldn't believe that he'd make that into a race car. So he started tearing it apart, tore all the upholstery out of it and everything, was tearing the fenders off and stuff. So he ended up taking it up to Coon Road. We all went up there to race. Well, a 37 Ford had mechanical brakes on it and they were something else to try to stop. And he came in the corner too fast with the thing and end up flipping it, oh, total it right out. Just, I mean, it was just a crying shame. And it just wrecked the car and just for no reason. He quit racing after that. Uh -huh. Went to Coon Road because Ronnie was, he, that was the first time he was going there. Right. And uh, well, there was a guy that came in there from out of town and he had, a, he had a little, like a 36 Ford Coupe that was really modified up and everything. He'd just run away with everybody except Ronnie and Ronnie could pretty well keep up with him. But the biggest thing Ronnie and I always talk about, there's uh, Jim Hauser, the Hauser boys were, you know, really uh, had the handle on that track and everything. And, and we all, the race got over and we were all in the pits and Jim come crawling out of his car and, and the track was very dusty. And he come crawling out of his car and you couldn't tell whether he was black or white or what he was. <laughs> <laughs> he crawled out and he went, <laughs> you know, blew his nose both ways. And, and he had a white mark around his nose and Ronnie and I just sit there laughing at him. And, oh, gosh. I can't believe Ronnie didn't tell you about that because it was, you know, yeah, yeah. it was, it was, we always talk about it every time we talk about Coon Road again. Oh, but golly. it was, that was pretty much uh, all about all I can remember. That was 50 some years ago. So 48 Ford Coupe. And Do you remember the number of that car? It might have been 11 because that was the easiest thing to paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> 11 or 1. <laughs> Do you remember much about the track? What kind of track it, you know, just... It was, uh, it wasn't a real bad track. It was, you go downhill one straightaway and back up the, the front straightaway, you go uphill and, and it was kind of a fast track and it was, you know, like it was a lot faster than Roller Bowl and mm -hmm. a lot of the other tracks. I think it was a little bigger, it seemed to be. But uh, he really get tooling on it. But uh, dust was a big problem on it, as much as I remember. When did you start taking racing seriously? I mean, you've had the financial wherewithal to actually have your own car and kind of ratchet it up. When I, I think it was about '64, and I got. Uh, I was working at Rain Tool, and, and finally I had a decent job. I was was uh, uh, a tool and die maker, mm -hmm. and uh, Rod Barton let me build a this car down in his garage. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a garage, and so I built the car all winter long, and and uh, 
that was really the first car and I had oh I had the most money I probably had almost eight hundred dollars and, and that was a lot of money back then and, and uh, so that's that was really and then that was the year I really started winning races along with it was usually Jay Piler and Ronnie or Ronnie was the big gun and mm -hmm. and the sportsman and stuff and then uh, and Jay Piler and and then I was winning you know right along with them guys and Lyle Brown was you know doing real well and but that was pretty much the start to my success was and you raced well not only sportsman's car but then you got into a late model what was that like to go from a transition to a, a late model car I don't know if I should be telling some of this stuff because it's it's a little weird, but Ronnie, I wanted to get in the late model and Ronnie was kind of coaxing me along. He was racing late model and Bob Snars had quit Haglin Rambler, so their car came up for sale and it was like $2,500. Well, I didn't have that kind of money at the time. and. Uh, Tri-M financing mm -hmm. was financing money, you know, at a pretty big interest, but I didn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, credit or anything, you know, built up yet, and Ronnie says, I'll, I'll sign for you if you want to get it, so he signed for me at Tri-M mm -hmm. financing to buy this car. So I went and picked it up on a Friday night and we went, we were racing Wattsburg at the time too, so uh, I went and picked it up, brought it home, hauled it to Wattsburg, and you know, charged the battery up and everything, got it running and stuff. Same tires, everything that was on it. <laughs> and I went out and started to race, run the heat race, and spun it out about three times in the heat race. And, and oh, I just, I was sick. And the biggest thing was all of this money invested and having Ronnie sign for me. You know, it uh, really put a lot of strain on me. So we, after the race, we loaded it back up because I just, it just wasn't working. So I told my wife, I says, we got to get a hold of Ronnie because he wasn't racing late model at the time and have him drive it. And I called him up and Ronnie, I said, you got to drive this car for me. And yeah. he, he says, no, he says, Skip, that's, you know, that's your car. You drive it. I said, I can't. I says, I, you know, I'm just so upset over my first day out with it and everything. And he says, no, you're going to drive it. And I, so I told my wife, you know, we're all friends and everything. And I said, you go down and tell Ronnie that he's got to drive this car. So she takes off and she starts out and while Ronnie is coming up ah. and he's going to help me set it up so I can drive it and stuff. And so he gets, he meets up with her, you know, and she's telling him, she says, he is a basket case right now <laughs> because, you know, he just, the uh, responsibility is so much. And so he, uh, he got there and he said, Skip, he said, I'll help you set it up. You know, there's nothing wrong with your driving. You're very capable of driving it, but you're going to drive it. I said, I'm not going to drive it, Ronnie. You're going to drive it. So he finally conceded he was going to drive it for me. So he uh, drove it and he done well. Won quite a few races with it and stuff and, and uh, Made it so we made enough money, paid it off, and then <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, our buddies, well, Punk Van Gilder, sure. was one of Ronnie's friends and stuff too, and he worked with us on it. And after the season was over, he says he would buy it, and so he bought it and for the same money as I did. And, oh my gosh! And he that's when Ronnie raced for him. But that's when I started seventy three or four. I Jerry Hoskins come and asked me if I wanted to drive for him, and I 
you know. He was willing to put the money up, and I was in Townline at the time in partnership with that, and Jerry had JD Auto Salvage, and, and I says, hey, sure, it's a start. Well, it took all the pressure off me because I had no money in it or anything, and that was really the start to my success because we started out, and I won a couple of races first year with that, and then we started winning more and more. And You're a tall guy. You're yeah. a big guy. Yeah. You, not every, when you think of stock car racers, not necessarily tall, big guys. Mm -hmm. Would that make you a little bit unique there? Was it, did it create some difficulties? It, uh, yes it did, but of course there was a lot of tall guys. You know, even NASCAR, you had uh, Tiny Lun, and I mean, he was bigger than I was, but of course that was NASCAR. But I had uh, a Vega Coupe that was my last sportsman I had. And we had that lowered so much, my head rubbed right on the roof all the time on that thing, <laughs> which was crazy, you know. If yeah. I'd ever flipped it, it was broke my neck, I'm sure. But uh, I don't, you know, I was probably one of the tallest guys around here that was racing, yeah. but you know, it was no disadvantage. I had good reflexes for being a good, uh, a big guy. And uh, of course, I played in all the sports in school until I graduated and everything, so I had the, that kind of ability that helped make a difference. What kept you going? Well, I just loved it. Yeah. I loved racing and fans. I had fans and then along the way I had different people, you know, wanted to help out and I always had a, a good crew of guys that, uh, you know, really enjoyed racing with me and stuff, so. That was the biggest thing, and I had a wife that was very cooperative, you know. I, a lot of people would have had to fight all these years to, to get along and race and stuff, but she's just been right by my side to, through everything, you know. I, that was one thing, I really had a superwoman, so. Yeah. I'm sure you still do. <laughs> well, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was there a year or two that was really outstanding when you look back and say, Greg, my super year was such and such? About, uh, well, 1979, 1978 is when I got my face smashed up and my head and everything all busted up. And what was that? What was that incident? That was up at Erie. I was in a, there was a big pile up ahead of me and I, I was going to miss it. Back then all the the fast car started at the tail end and early in the race there was a big pile up and I was going to miss it and come out around it and there was a rookie coming up behind me that didn't look ahead and stuff and he hit me and drove me into it. Mm. There was a, a bumper sticking out of a car and that threw my side window and that's what busted my face up and stuff. But, uh, I don't know where were we here, but oh, the best five, best year. Been, yeah, best year. Okay, now the next year after that, I I'd won the point championship in the same car that I oh. I wrecked in and stuff, and I won state line and area in the circuit. And, well, then the following year, I I sold that car to Jim Polaro, and I bought a what they call a Gigolo chassis. It was out of Georgia, but I bought it from another guy down in in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, and he didn't like the car, and he was a top gun too, or, you know, around the country. He was a good driver, and the car came up for sale. Well, I heard it was going to be for sale at the beginning of the season, so I went down and tried to buy it, and he says, uh, well, his, his crew man talked him out of selling it, so later on in the season, one of the uh, writers for, I think it was, I don't know, one of the racing magazines and stuff come up to me and he says, you better go check with McNeely. He says, he wants to sell that car now. So I went over and talked to him and we made the deal and went down and picked it up. And the next, in fact, the following week after I picked it up, we, it was after the season was over and we started running invitationals with it. And I went down to 
to uh, Mansfield, Ohio, and I set fast time there. And that weekend, and went to uh, uh, Wayne County Speedway the following weekend, set a new track record there. And he's following all this. He's following me around wow. to see how I was doing. He said he's never, never had a fast time with a car or anything, you know. So then the following week, I went down to Sinclairsville, Ohio, and I set a new track record down there in fast time with it. But that was probably the most fun car, and I won quite a lot of races with that the following year with it. And Could you make a living uh, with racing? No, no. I. Uh, uh, our kind of racing, I don't, it'd be hard to make a living. I know some guys did, but they had backing enough that, uh, you know, where they could and, and they got by, yeah. you know, but uh, it was just a different situation. I never, I always knew I, I, I enjoyed business and stuff too, but that uh, I wasn't really going to try to go any farther in NASCAR or anything like that, so. Was, was your uh, race the one, that's the most satisfying race, maybe one where you didn't expect to win or came from far <laughs> yeah. yeah, Yeah, that was Orville, Ohio at uh, Wayne County Speedway. I, uh, we just put a new car together. I was running Stan Hoover's cars. And during that, that week, we, uh, I bought a new car from, new chassis and everything. We had to put everything together and we were trying to get ready for the race in, in Wayne County and we had about five, six, eight guys down to Hoover's place putting things, transferring from one car to another. And so we went, had to get the car ready and went to Wayne County and started out and I couldn't get that car on the track. And, and finally, on the, I had to run a, a B feature, and I won that, so that got me into the A main. I had to start in the tail. And things started out, and wasn't really doing too good, and then all of a sudden, I, just things started getting better. And I mean, it was a stars race, and they had all the best around, and, and I just started coming up through passing everybody. <laughs> And my car was start hooking up when they started slipping too much, and and ended up that was a hundred lapper, and ended up uh, winning that. But at, on the last lap, I got coming on traffic, and this other guy come on me, and he got got ahead of me, and I bowled my way through and beat him by a fender. Oh my gosh. Yeah, won that. That was the first big race, you know, out of town race that yeah. I'd won. Was there much in the pits, you know, the old guys when I talk into the, but you know, the Floyd finales and Bud, <laughs> but all that stuff, just pit action, you know, with the fisticuffs or the oh, guys that hot headed. Oh yeah. Did, were that, was that much during your time period? Oh yeah. Of course I was one of them at times, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's, you know, probably finales, and the brothers would fight amongst themselves as much as anything do, so. But, uh, oh, there was always, you know, some hard feelings going on and stuff. That's, that's racing, but the biggest thing there is, you know, you've got your life on the line, and your adrenaline is running so high that uh, it puts you in another world, and it's, uh, oh, I've, I've really, Made a fool of myself at times. Well, we won't talk about that. No. <laughs>